Excellent. Okay, welcome everyone to today's BPS. And today we're very happy to have Balash Rat and Sandra Rokop from Budapest. And they're gonna talk about their recent work on percolation of worms. And as usual, we have two 45 minute lectures. Today, Balash will give the first talk and then Sandor will take it from there. Okay, Balash, please. So um, thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to give this talk. And um, well, Balash, this is my you first- to, uh, Sorry, you have to start sharing your screen again. Okay, let stop. me start sharing my screen. Sorry, okay, um, my whole screen. Um, second. And uh, um, so thanks uh, for um, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. So uh, I'm going to give the first talk about a recent paper, which is um, um, which is about percolation of worms, uh, an object that I will define soon. So this is this is a fun project, and I'll uh, this first talk is is going to be about the context and and uh, uh, also the environment, so the literature of this problem, and I'll also emphasize some very nice open questions that our research uh, has le left open. So so let me first. Um, uh, so I, I, this talk is about worms, but first I want to talk about more generally animals. Um, and then I'll define a, a certain object called the Poisson Zoo. And then I will later specify to a very specific species of animals, which are worms. So, um, uh, oh, before I start, so please feel free to interrupt if, if you don't understand something. Um, Sunshine will notify me if, if there if someone wants to ask a question in the chat. So um, this the, uh, this talk is meant to be easy to understand. So if you don't understand, then then uh, then I'm I'm it's my fault, and you should uh, ask for clarification. So so I'm going to talk about um, percolation on the d-dimensional lattice, so Zd, which means that I'm going to talk about a random subgraph of the d-dimensional lattice, and I'm going to talk about the connectivity properties of this random subgraph. Um, so this is the usual notation. And let me define animals. So this curly age is, is the collection of lattice animals, uh, which means uh, lattice animals rooted at the origin. And I'm, this is how I denote the root. So age is the set of finite connected subsets of Zd that contain the ori origin. So the, this is what we will call lattice animals rooted at the origin. And uh, now I'm going to uh, define lattice animals rooted somewhere else. And this is going to be a pair where x is a vertex of Zd and h is a lattice animal rooted at the origin. And then um, the trace of such an animal is just the translated set. So, so I translate this set uh, by this random vector x. So I shift the random vector so that its root uh, is, is at um, not the origin, but at x. And then uh, now I'm going to uh, define, oops, can you see? Uh, because I cannot see the top of the screen. Can you see what's on the top of the screen? Yes, should try to, I, I, I can, can see, see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Poisson Zoo. So I'm, now, I'm, now that I defined animals, I want to define the Poisson Zoo, which is going to be a percolation model. Namely, let's consider new, and it's going to be a probability measure on the set of animals rooted at the origin. So just a random, connect, a random finite connected subset of Zd that contains the origin. That's, um, uh, so the, the, the law of that is new. And then there is also going to be an intensity parameter V. Uh, and I'm going to define some sort of Poisson point process, but it's so simple that you can define it using Poisson random variables. So here is the notation. So this n superscript v subscript h uh, xh is going to be the number of copies of 
the animal uh, rooted at x, uh, and this animal age, but rooted at x. And then I'm going to define this n superscript uh, x age to be a Poisson random variable when I multiply the intensity with the probability of seeing this animal under the measure nu. And this is defined for all vertices and all animals. And these random variables are all independent. And then I can uh, define the main object of study. Um, main object of study here, uh, which, which is just this set superscript V. So this set superscript V is a random subset of the d-dimensional lattice. And it's just the union for all vertices, for all animals, for all uh, these, um, the union of these sets where I take the union from I to NX uh, superscript VH. And of course, uh, you can immediately realize that the only thing that matters about these random variables is that whether they are zero or bigger than zero, because uh, it doesn't really matter if the value of this number is two or three, because you take the union of copies of x plus h multiple times. So the only thing that matters about these guys is whether these random variables, uh, uh, these Poisson guys, whether they are zero or not. Nevertheless, it's, it's nicer to think about uh, Poisson point processes as you will later see. Um, and this S of V is what we call the trace of the Poisson zoo at level V. And uh, if you don't like this definition, then you can alternatively define this, uh, the same model as follows. Um, for each random, uh, for each vertex X of ZD, you just consider IID Poisson random variables with parameter V, where V is this intensity, and you, now I'm defining it um, informally. So for each vertex X, you put IID copies of animals which have distribution according to this new, but you translate, it, uh, translate them by X. And uh, this is just, uh, these two definitions that I gave can be seen to be equivalent. So this is uh, how we define the Poisson zoo. And are there any questions at this point? Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. OK. Uh, so let's uh, continue. And here are some, so this is a percolation. Uh, yes. Lars, sorry to interrupt. One uh, question. Yes. So you are putting a Poisson number of IID copies of the animal according to the measure nu at a point. Yes. So this union of these animals will be yet another animal, right? It's as if you're putting one copy of some big uh, lattice animal at a point. Can't you, I mean, is that correct? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I did not understand the question. I'm saying um, union of animals centered at X will also be an animal, right? Um, well, the union of animals with the same root uh, yes. is indeed an animal. Right. But, so, uh, yeah. So does it mean that if you are putting Poisson number of animals at a given location uh, rooted at X? Yes. Then indeed, it's as if you're putting one animal with a different distribution. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, one or zero. So, so if... Yeah, uh, okay. One so if, yeah. if, the if the intensity is very low, so if V is low, then actually mo mo most of the vertices of ZD are not going to be covered <laughs> by an animal. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so did I, uh, did I answer your question? No, yes. Uh, yes, yes. You answered the question. That's not a problem. Yeah. I was just wondering if that is helpful instead of considering Poisson number. Just putting uh, one or zero that are. Uh, well, you're right that uh, actually, but there are some advantages uh, of of looking at Poisson point processes, and hopefully, I will convince you that that uh, this this is a, a reasonable setup. But indeed, in this generality, one could switch to uh, an equivalent model where you put on each vertex, you decide 
whether there is a, an animal rooted at that vertex or not with a certain probability, and then you put one animal there. But, uh, okay. but um, uh, there, there will be some advantages of, 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 uh, of this setup as well. Okay. So let me mention a couple of uh, basic properties of um, uh, the Poisson Zoo. Uh, for example, there is a well-known monotone coupling. So you can, if you take the same underlying measure on animals, new, but you take two different intensities, V1 and V2, then you can couple these percolation models in a way that uh, the, uh, the trace of the Poisson Zoo with the bigger intensity contains the uh, one with the smaller intensity. And also, uh, one, it's easy to check that uh, this random subset uh, that we uh, constructed is actually ergodic. Uh, so it's invariant under spatial translations, and it's actually ergodic under uh, spatial translations. And um, these two facts uh, will become very handy when we define uh, critical thresholds for percolation. So here's a little bit of percolation uh, terminology for you. So if uh, the, so, remember that this S superscript of V it's a random subset of vertices of Z D, and if X is in this subset, then in percolation language we call this vertex occupied, and if X is in the complement of S V, then we call it vacant. And uh, we say that this random subset percolates if and only if. Uh, the subgraph of ZD spanned by this random subset uh, contains an infinite connected component. And here I mean with respect to the nearest neighbor metric uh, or the nearest neighbor graph structure of ZD. So um, I hope that definition makes sense. If not, I'll clarify. Um, so the subgraph of ZD spanned by the occupied sites or the sides that are in SV, this is, uh, oops, sorry, S, uh, this is supposed to be S superscript V here, not S superscript U. Um, and then the question is, uh, does this um, subset percolate and or not? And how does this depend on the intensity? And then by the monotonicity and ergodicity property that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, it follows, that there exists a critical threshold for uh, that uh, for the intensity parameter that I will call V subscript C. Um, that at this point it can be zero or plus infinity as well, um, such that the following holds: if the intensity is smaller than the critical intensity, then uh, the set S superscript V. So sorry, you you should see you should. Imagine that there are Vs all over here. So that percolation occurs with probability zero, but if the intensity is bigger than uh, this critical threshold, then percolation occurs with probability one. So this is a general fact. This is called phase transition if it's non-trivial. But what does this mean? In words, this, mean, this means that if the intensity is smaller than this critical threshold, then the, uh, all of the connected components of um, the set of occupied sites is finite almost surely. But if V is uh, greater than the critical threshold, then almost surely there is an infinite connected component of occupied sites. And this is uh, what we call percolation. Um, but the question is, is this phase transition really non-trivial? So is this critical threshold is it positive and finite? Meaning that really, if you take the intensity parameter low enough, then do you see a non-percolative regime where all the collected components are finite? And if V is big enough, do you see a percolative regime where you have an infinite connected component? So this is the question of non-triviality of phase transition. And well, the second question is easier. So, uh, since uh, I postulated that an animal contain uh, uh, an animal has to contain the origin, then therefore it's easy to see that the set of occupied sites uh, stochastically dominates 
an IID Bernoulli configuration. Bernoulli configuration meaning that you decide about whether each uh, vertex is occupied or not independently from the other. So this is the case when uh, animals contain only one side. Um, so uh, this model stochastically dominates uh, Bernoulli percolation whose uh, parameter becomes bigger as you increase the parameter V. And therefore, uh, an easy calculation shows that this VC, the critical threshold for any uh, uh, Poisson zoo is finite and it's uniformly upper bounded by the logarithm of one over one minus PC, where PC denotes the critical threshold for Bernoulli site percolation on the d-dimensional lattice. So this is trivial. So the second question is trivially yes, but still that leaves the first question open. Uh, is this critical threshold positive? Uh, and then the answer to this second question is more complicated. And this is what the rest of the talk is going to be about. So the answer depends on how you choose the law of animals. Um, and here, but here are two easy lemmas uh, uh, to put things in context, two easy lemmas about the critical threshold. The first lemma is going to be a trivial condition uh, showing uh, under which there is no percolation at phase transition. So under which you see percolation for all intensities. So VC is zero. And the second lemma is going to be an easy, uh, uh, sufficient condition for having non-trivial percolation. But these two lemmas are very easy. So the first lemma is what we will call the first moment lemma. So if you define the first moment, this is the first moment. So this is the expected size of an animal which has distribution new. So the expected cardinality of uh, an animal under this probability distribution new that we consider. So if the mean of this random variable is infinite, then there is no phase transition for a very trivial reason, because in fact, if the first moment is, uh, is positive, then uh, this implies that for any intensity, the set of sites covered by an animal is ZD. And why is that? Because um, the expected number of animals that contain the origin is V times the first moment of the expected uh, uh, number. Of, so M1 is the expected number, the expected size of an animal with distribution mu. And one can, it's easy to check by, it's called the mass transport principle, that the expected size of, or the expected total size in the Poisson zoo model, the expected total size of animals that contain the origin is V times M1. And it's, and it's also easy to check that this number has Poisson law. So if the parameter is infinite, then of course the origin or any other vertex is covered by infinitely many uh, animals almost surely. So that's just an easy lemma. And here's another lemma, which is a bit less easy, uh, which involves the second moment. So now if you take this M2, which is the second moment of the size of an animal with distribution nu. So if this second moment is finite, then uh, you do have percolation phase transition. So the critical threshold is positive. So in other words, if the intensity V is small enough, then the trace of the worms only contains um, finite connected components. And in fact, we can give an explicit lower bound on this parameter, um, uh, which involves uh, the second moment. And I'm not really going to detail the proof of this, uh, but the heuristic idea is you can explore the connected cluster of the origin by taking a look at the animals that pass through the origin. And then you can take the union of those animals. Then you can take a look at those animals that uh, intersect this, or well, at least adjacent to this set. Uh, and then you can go on and explore 
the connected cluster on, uh, of the origin, like going through generation to generation, um, uh, in, uh, always in the next round, uh, looking at the animals that connect to the cluster that you previously explored. And this exploration of the cluster of the origin, this can be easily coupled and in fact dominated by a subcritical branching process. So if the intensity is low enough, then this dominating branching process is going to be subcritical, which gives uh, the finiteness of the cluster of the origin. And then easily, if the cluster of the origin is finite almost surely, then the cluster of every vertex is finite almost surely by translation invariance. Therefore, the percolation is subcritical. And then uh, you can check that the offspring distribution of this dominating branching process is actually its compound Poisson distribution. And one more word why the second moment comes up, it's um, size biasing, because you have to look at the expectation of the total cardinality of animals that contain the origin. And we could see that the expected number of animals that contain the origin has to do with the first moment of our measure, but the expected total cardinality of animals that contain the origin is already related to the second moment. So I don't want to talk more about this uh, second moment lemma because I consider it trivial. You can check the um, check our paper uh, for the proof of it. Uh, but there are these two trivial lemmas. One is a trivial bound which gives no percolation if the first moment is infinite. Second lemma, the second moment lemma, uh, gives a, 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 condi a, a sufficient condition for positivity of the critical threshold for so non-triviality of phase transition if the second moment is finite. But well, you can see this is not a very exhaustive characterization. The question is, are these lemmas sharp? Are any of these lemmas sharp? So first, let's um, take a look at the first moment lemma. And again, the answer depends on the specific choice of the distribution on animals. And here's a theorem that was um, that's already 13 years old, and it's uh, not formulated entirely in this, in this context. So this is a theorem about the so-called Poisson Boolean model, but it can be very easily translated to a result on ZD, so on the context of the Poisson Zoo. So if these animals in the zoo are actually watermelon or puffer fish, or I don't know, so some anim imagine some animal which is spherical shape. So if this underlying probability measure, which is the law of the animals uh, rooted at the origin. So if this, uh, so this is the law of a ball with a random radius, then actually uh, the first lemma is sharp. The first moment lemma is sharp, namely if the first moment of this, so the expected, if the expected volume of this random ball uh, is finite, then actually that's already enough, uh, or Guary shows that uh, then already you have non-trivial phase transition. So that's, that's a nice answer. So if the first moment is infinite, then of course VC is zero, but then Guary tells us that in this case, if the animals are balls, then finiteness of first moment implies uh, positivity of, uh, of the critical threshold. So in this sense, this M1 condition can be sharp, so it cannot be weakened. But let's take a look at the other lemma. Uh, can, uh, can you, is that lemma sharp in a similar sense? And we cannot really answer this question. So we pose it, let's pose it as an open question. So given some D greater than or equal to two, uh, can this M2 lemma be strengthened? Meaning that can you, is there a function which grows slower than uh, N squared? So is there kind of a fractional moment which is smaller than second moment such that uh, for any choice of the distribution of the animals, this condition, so 
finiteness of this F moment. Well, it's not really a moment. So the finiteness of the expectation of F of the cardinality under mu, so the finiteness of that, does that already imply um, non-triviality of phase transition? Um, so this is an open question, but, and, okay, so I'm not brave enough to say that this, the question of this, the answer to this question is negative, but we will show, so we will show that this M2 condition is quite close to being sharp for a very specific choice of the underlying measure on animals. So you could see on the previous slide that a specific choice of the underlying measure mu shows that the first moment condition can be sharp, and we are going to choose a measure mu that shows that this second moment condition is well rather close to being sharp. So let me go on describing this specific choice, and this is going to be the titular random length worms model. So now the rest of the talk is about worms. Uh, how much time do I have left, by the way? About 20 minutes. About 20 minutes, thank you. So the rest, the rest of the talk is about worms. And let me define a worm. So now I'm going to define this underlying probability measure on animals. So let's consider Xn, a simple symmetric random walk on the d-dimensional lattice, which starts from the origin. And L is going to be the length of a worm. So L is a ran, uh, an integer valued random variable, which is independent of the walker. And then the worm is going to be the law, so this measure mu is going to be the law of the first L steps of my random walk. So this is a random subset of ZD. This is the trace of the random walk in the first L steps, but it's first L steps starting with zero and ending with L minus one. Uh, so in particular, it's a non-empty subset. So this is, this is a random animal, and therefore I can specify from now on as superscript V is uh, the trace of the, so the Poisson zoo with this particular choice of mu is called the ran random length worms model at level V. Um, and you can alternatively define, or you can alternatively imagine the random uh, length worms model as follows. For each vertex of ZD, you consider Poisson V number of worms, starting from that site, and those worms are IID uh, with this distribution. So you run each of the worms for a random length, um, and all of the worms are independent for each worm that you start from each vertex of ZD. And then SV is the set of sites visited by these worms. So the question is, uh, is, the, is this set uh, connected or not? So do we have percolation or not? And uh, well, first of all, let's see what our trivial lemmas, the first moment and the second moment lemmas say. And then, well, we are going to assume dimension greater than or equal to five anyway. So it, dimension is, oops, the dimension here is big enough so that the length of a worm is uh, comparable to the cardinality of the trace. So, you know, if uh, probably already dimension greater, uh, greater than three is enough here, uh, but since we are talking about the second moment, d greater than or equal to five is definitely enough. So really the length of the worm and the cardinality of the trace of the worm are, are uh, uh, comparable. So second moment, uh, this M2, the second moment of the cardinality is finite if and only if the uh, second moment of the length is finite. Um, and then, of course, our second moment lemma gives the following result. So if you choose the distribution of the length of the worms so that its second moment is finite, then you have non-triviality uh, of phase transition. And now uh, our main result is in some sense a converse to this. So here is our main result. Uh, so we assume that the underlying uh, lattice has dimension greater than or equal to five. And let's pick some positive epsilon 
and let's assume that L0 is some big enough number so that the log log makes sense. Um, so let me define uh, the length distribution by this specific choice. So the probability that the length of the worm is equal to L is this log log L to the power epsilon divided by L cube log L. And I'm restricting to the lengths which are greater than L0. So for this specific choice of the length distribution, and we denote by ML the mass function of the length distribution. So if this satisfied, then there is no phase transition. The, the set uh, percolates uh, for every uh, po positive value of the parameter. I should have emphasized that uh, for this model, um, the first moment is definitely finite. And since the first moment is finite, this means that if you choose the parameter V, if you choose the intensity small, then you create a set with small density. Uh, nevertheless, you can, so by making the intensity V small, you can make the density of this random set, the set of worms. It, you can make it arbitrarily small. Nevertheless, it always percolates. So it's a, sm a set with small density, but it always contains an infinite connected component for any positive value of V. So let me further discuss uh, uh, the statement. So this, okay, so this is an ugly formula and I'm repeating that ugly formula up here, but I want to argue that this distribution is actually, so, okay. Um, let me, so here's the discussion. So our main result is about uh, this formula when epsilon is positive, and then our main results implies, or our main result states that there is no phase transition. But keep in mind that if you choose epsilon to be in this same formula, if you choose epsilon to be less than minus one, then actually it's an easy exercise uh, to sum these values, of course, multiplied with L square so that the corresponding uh, second moment is already finite. Therefore, by our trivial lemma, uh, VC is positive. So the message is that we work very hard uh, to show that the second moment lemma is actually close to being sharp, meaning that we are log-log. It's, it's only log-log close to being sharp. So uh, the... Like these are the two results that we have. And you can see that the gap between these two results is only of log log order. So there is only a regime uh, of mass functions of log log width where, where we cannot really say what happens, where we cannot really tell whether VC is positive or is it zero. Um, and by the way, um, you, when you see the next talk, when you see Shani's talk, you can see that uh, actually our main result can be strengthened. So there is a, a more general but more complicated uh, 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 theorem that we can prove. And this, this specific choice of um, the length distribution is, a, is a, a corollary of that. And let me just say one word about um, why do we need to have dimension greater than equal to five? So the short answer is that um, if the dimension is uh, greater than or equal to five, then somehow worms are going to be well behaved. So um, the capacity of a worm is going to be comparable to the cardinality of a worm, but Shani will talk more about that. But um, intuitively, a worm or a random walk, the trace of a random walk is a two-dimensional object. So now I'm, I, this is very poetic, but the trace of a random walk is a two-dimensional object. And uh, if you want um, your model to behave like the branching process approximation, then you certainly want uh, worms to avoid each other as much as they can. And of course you need, uh, if you want two two-dimensional objects to avoid each other, so two independent worms are two independent two-dimensional objects. 
So if you want these guys to avoid each other, then you'd better make the underlying space bigger than uh, the dimension of the space to be five or higher, because if you're in five dimensional space, then there is enough room for two dimensional objects to avoid each other. So of course, this was very uh, vague, but Shani will give uh, more technical details. So this is why we have to choose dimension greater than or equal to five. But nevertheless, are a bit, we are a bit dissatisfied with our um, uh, result because the previous result where, where uh, we, so the result of uh, Guere here, where is it? So this result is very nice because it's like definitive. So for the balls model, if the first moment is infinite, then you don't have a phase transition. If first moment is finite, then you have a phase transition. And we cannot, our result is not as good as this. So let's pose it as an open question. Is it true that the second moment decides about the percolation property or the non-triviality of the phase transition of the Worms model. So we, by the second moment lemma, we know that if the second moment is finite, then the critical threshold is positive. But is it true that if the second moment is infinite, does that imply that there is no uh, phase transition and you percolate for all positive values of V? So this is, I think, a very nice open question and we cannot answer it but you will see in Shani's talk what we can actually do. Um, nevertheless, if the answer to this question is positive, then the answer to the previous question is negative, at least for dimension greater than or equal to five. So if the answer to this question is positive, then the Worms model would show that the second moment lemma is sharp. Um, and the previous question was um, about that, but formulated in a, in a reverse way. So let me try to point out the main technical problem in trying to solve this open question or trying to show that. Um, ba Balash, one yes. question. Yes. So even in Guerre's result, it's only again in the context of continuum, Poisson, Boolean model. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Balls, right? Yes. There is nothing uh, like that for arbitrary sets. Uh, so that is for balls. Yeah, yeah. His result is uh, for balls, but I did not understand the rest of the question. Ah, I meant to say that even there, if you consider more arbitrary random sets, not necessarily yes. balls, will, uh, I mean, is this expected, the sharpness? Uh, is it known anything? Well, um, I don't know how much. Uh, that result can be generalized. Uh, so certainly, um, uh, instead of balls, you could consider boxes or generally any set which contains a ball of comparable radius and is contained in a ball with a comparable ra radius. You, that the 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 result of Guerre um, uh, generalizes to that. But for uh, Set, random sets with other shape, well, many things can happen. So, so I, I still, uh, you will, um, so I still have five minutes to discuss about various models. So you will see that sometimes it's the first moment condition that's sharp. Sometimes uh, the second moment condition is more close to being sharp. So the general message is that really you have to go uh, deep into the properties of the distribution of animals that you look at. Um, so did I answer your question? Yeah, yes, very much. Yeah. Thank you. But, uh, but uh, still, uh, you will uh, see some related results where um, uh, you can see that sometimes uh, this lemma is sharp, sometimes the other one. So the technical problem is if we want to show that the second moment condition is sharp, that means that we really have to make this branching process domination actually a branching branching process approximation. And you know, it's it's uh, um, this of course not uh, so. In some sense, this is impossible to do on ZD because the dominating branching process grows exponentially. But on ZD, the exploration uh, is only going to grow uh, with a linear radius. Um, that's easy to show. So 
At one point, uh, our branching process approximation has to break down. So one has to give new ideas because the problem with ZB is that, uh, so if we already like used up worms coming from a spatial region, then that region already develops a shortage of worms. So it's hard to uh, pretend that you are in the case of a branching process where each generation is a fresh new start. So, okay, so this is rather vague. Uh, Shani will give more technical details. Let me, however, let me give, so I have something like four minutes to talk about related models, which are um, very interesting and they shed some light on our results as well. So I already mentioned the result of Gueri, which is in fact, uh, formulated in a continuum setting where you have uh, RD, not ZD, so the uh, continuous Euclidean d-dimensional space, and you have a Poisson point process of Euclidean balls. Nevertheless, it's, it, nevertheless, it's easy to uh, couple discrete balls. Uh, so our, uh, so it's easy to translate his result in the discrete setting. Uh, and I already mentioned that, so I don't want to say more about it. But here is another model called finite, finitary random interlacements. This is a work of Kokacha, Kai, Zhang, and, and others. There are multiple papers written in the last five years. Uh, some of them are very recent, which is actually, it's like the random length worms model, but the length has very specific geometric distribution. So from our point of view, it's not very interesting because it, it falls on, under the uh, realm of the finiteness of, so, so this length, length distribution has finite second moment. So of course there is a non-triviality of phase transition, but on the, on the other hand, they use a different parametrization than ours. And also they give much more fine percolation, uh, much finer percolation properties and not just uh, non-triviality of phase transition. Uh, but I don't want to say more about this. So they talk about a more specific model, but they give uh, much more per, uh, detailed results about uh, percolation phase transition. Um, also, uh, actually, after we wrote a paper, it turned out that what we defined as Poisson Zoo essentially already exists in a paper that was uh, uh, defined a couple of months earlier. It's called Bernoulli hyper edge percolation. So it's pretty much the same as Poisson Zoo, but the results of that paper focus on, on a completely different direction. So it's about the case when there is phase transition. Uh, and for example, Chang proves uh, non trivial uh, uniqueness of the infinite cluster, whereas uh, our focus is on. The cases of the Poisson Zoo where you have no percolation phase transition, for example, the Worms model. Also, there is a, a similar model, again, formulated in a continuum setting. So it's Wiener sausage percolation. So it's, it's about fat, fat Brownian motions, Wiener sausages. Nevertheless, it's easy to translate that, their result, at least on a heuristic level, to our case. And that's essentially about worms, where the length of the worm is fixed. So it's about um, uh, uh, worms with fixed length. And of course, then there is a non-trivial phase transition, but already their result um, shows that there is certain behavior if the dimension is greater than equal to five and uh, somehow different behavior if the dimension is uh, lower. And what the, the main result is, is an asymptotic uh, expansion. So they give upper and matching upper and lower bounds on the critical threshold if the intensity goes to zero. So if, the, if V goes to zero, this is the, or, or T goes, sorry, if T goes to infinite, so T is large but finite, this is how uh, the critical, so the bigger the T, the smaller the critical threshold, and these are the formulas. Uh, so I'm slowly running out of time, so I'll have to be very brief with two of the most related models. One is called ellipsis percolation. So here, um, uh, well, Teixeira and Unganetti 
uh, Ungaretti uh, throw down not worms, but rather sticks or random ellipses where one of the axes has width one, but the other axis has uh, a polynomial decay. And then their main result uh, is that depending on the decay of the length of these sticks with random orientation in the plane, you can have, so if the tail is very fat, then these ellipses cover the whole space. So this is essentially uh, our first moment lemma. And if um, they show that if the decay is fast enough, then there is a non-triviality of phase transition. This is um, essentially our second moment lemma is except for the alpha equals two case. And uh, when this decay of the length distribution is strictly between one and two, then they have this strange uh, property that the set percolates. Nevertheless, um, it's not the entire space. Um, oh, sorry, the, uh, but sorry, uh, this is a typo. So here, VC should be equal to zero. And in particular, if you are, if you observe the alpha equals two case, so the alpha greater than two case is kind of trivial. It's the second moment lemma. But if alpha is exactly equal to two, then you have infinite second moment, but you do have non-trivial phase transition. So for this model, uh, this model shows that in two dimensions, the second moment uh, lemma is not sharp because there are cases when or you can choose these animals at least in continuum space in a way that um, that the second moment is infinite. Nevertheless, less. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, but uh, sorry. So if alpha is equal to two, then the second moment is infinite, but you have non-triviality of phase transition. Um, and the other more related model is called loop percolation that I'm not really going to define. But uh, heuristically, this loop percolation corresponds to the Worms model with a very specific polynomial decay of lengths. And uh, this, uh, the, the theorem of Artyom Sapozhnikov and Yinshan Chang from 2016 is that we have non-trivial phase transition. But it's very funny that uh, this only follows from the second moment condition uh, if the dimension is greater than or equal to five. But if you look at this polynomial decay in dimensions three and four, then second moment is infinite, yet there is a non-trivial phase transition. So again, if the dimension is three or four, then this model alone shows that the second moment lemma is not sharp. Um, so I think uh, uh, I'll thank you for your attention now. I ran out of time and I apologize for that. Um, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions for Balash? Uh, so well, I have one question. Um, yes. So in the Wiener sausage percolation model. Yes. Um, if you allow the time to be random like you do for the worm model. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then are the results similar? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we could. Uh, so, so I think one could prove analogous results uh, to ours uh, for Wiener sausage percolation for the same uh, length distributions. So essentially a Wiener, so you know, uh, this is heuristic, but uh, Wiener sausage uh, um, with a unit, uh, so Wiener sausage is a, a, the trace of a Brownian motion and you put, uh, balls of uh, radius one uh, around those uh, around this trace. So ma you make it a sausage. That's heuristically, that's pretty much the same as considering a random walk. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, on ZD, you, you imagine that uh, if you visit a vertex, that's like uh, putting a, a ball of radius one around it. So th the answer is yes, uh, by heuristics or by analogy, uh, Whatever we say about length distributions, a Worms model with a certain length dis distribution, there should be an analogous result for Wiener sausage percolation with the same length distribution. 
Nevertheless, I consider the Wiener sausage model to be a bit harder technically. So like, um, but the techniques are the same, but Erhard and Poissa has to work. So had they chosen uh, uh, worms instead of sausages, uh, their paper would be shorter. Okay. But also, so it means that even in your model, then dimensions two, three, four, you should be um, a similar kind of the thing that it won't happen. M2 is not good. Uh, well, okay. So let me take the opportunity to, uh, to say something about a slide that I skipped. So here are some con conjectures about the worms model in dimensions three and four. So, but our conjectures are a bit crude. So we only make conjectures about the case when um, the mass function, so the tail, so this is, if you remember this ML, this is the mass probability mass function of the length distribution. And let's assume for uh, these conjectures that these are polynomially decaying. So the conjecture is that, um, um, well, okay, first of all, it trivially follows from the second moment lemma that if beta is greater than three, then the second moment is finite, therefore you have phase transition, but if beta is less than or equal than two, then the first moment is infinite, and therefore there is no phase transition because everything is covered by worms. So the interesting regime is when beta is between two and three, and here's the conjecture in three dimensions that somehow the the threshold for beta is five over two. So if, so we conjecture that you have phase transition if beta is halfway between two and three and note that loop percolation where they show non-triviality of uh, phase transition corresponds to exactly the case where beta is five over two. And in dimension four, we conjecture that if you're looking at Distrib uh, tail distributions of this form, so you assume that it decays polynomially, then actually the second moment lemma is sharp, but we conjecture that it, well, actually the loop percolation shows that it's not really sharp uh, because if you choose beta exactly to be three, then the second moment is infinite, yet there is a, a non-trivial phase transition. Okay, so that was a bit quick, and I don't know if I answered your question. That's okay. Yeah, I think uh, th that was uh, good. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, any other questions? Uh, one. Uh, so uh, this is maybe similar to the Taishaga model. So in your case, you took these worm models, but uh, you could. What if you pick just a straight line? Let's say in the in Z two, you pick a straight line of an of a random length in one of four directions. It good is good question. Uh, Yes, uh, continue. Uh, no, no, the, uh, it looks like something that is a bit easy to percolate, so. Uh... Um, so let's call them sticks. And yeah. uh, maybe I should have mentioned, uh, maybe, uh, so there are uh, some uh, papers about percolation of sticks uh, that I did not mention here, but uh, th those results are not about sticks with the uh, polynomial decay. Uh, or where the length of the sticks have polynomial decay. So good question. I cannot really, um, so I don't know if um, there is any difference. So uh, similarly to worms, it's a, I think if you want to say something about sticks, then the higher dimension is easier and you get closer and closer to the sharpness of the second moment lemma if uh, dimension gets higher and maybe so now I'm, I'm I so this is just let's say a conjecture I did not really check this but we could prove whatever we can prove for worms um, we could prove so if there is a length distribution for which we can show lack of phase transition uh, so okay my let, let's go back to our main result so that I can. So if you go, if we consider the model that you mentioned, so let's choose one of the directions, one of the coordinate directions in the dimensional space. I think we could prove that if you look at length of sticks with similar decay like this, 
So under a similar, so consider a sticks model with a length distribution like this, then we could uh, show um, lack of phase transition. Nevertheless, that still uh, remains the question. So we could, one could ask uh, this analogous question about the sticks model. Is, is the second moment condition sharp? And I cannot really tell. All I know is that some, with some other guys here in Budapest called Cayo Alves and Ulla Elias, we are planning to look at the sticks model, but we never did. But maybe you know more about this. No, no, not at all. But somehow I was thinking only in the planar case, but even this model ah. would, would be easier in the higher dimension. Uh, uh, so in the planar case, I guess uh, that sticks model should behave similarly to the Teixeira model, the, the, the ellipses. But honestly, I, I did not look into that. So um, yeah, so I cannot comment. So, you know, in the ellipses model, the, uh, the direction is uniformly chosen. And in the model that you suggest, there are only, in the plane, there are really two directions, really, yes. uh, or, well, four. Uh, so I don't, don't know if that makes uh, anything different. But, uh, but good question anyway. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Balash? Yeah, yeah I Let think we can start the second session now. The, sorry? Yes, we can start the second session now. Yes, Andor, please. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, and thank you. And thank you uh, again for this opportunity to talk about this result, Bolaj and me myself. So the second part of this lecture will be about how to overcome uh, that problem that Bolaj mentioned earlier, that we cannot really use a branching process approximation in this setting because ZD is not that big in this uh, group theoretic meaning. And uh, to be honest, there I won't give fully pre precise proofs here because this paper is really technical, but I try to give the intuition behind everything and hopefully you get some take take away, take home uh, information with you. So, so before I can talk about the proofs, let me uh, give an alternative definition of, uh, of the random length Worms model, which, so Balaj already hinted that behind all of these Poisson zoo, there is a Poisson point process. And for the random length Worms model, it is really easy to uh, characterize this Poisson point, point, point process. It is, this definition is given here. So, we are given this in, uh, intensity parameter v and that probability mass function, which uh, induces the length of the worms consider. Then this random length worms model can be described as a, as a Poisson point process on the space of all the possible uh, ZD value nearest neighbor and path of finite lengths. So these paths are just simply the worms that we already talked about. So it, it won't be important, be, but we call this space the uh, space of worms. And uh, if we want to define a Poisson point process, we need to define, need to give its intensity measure, which intensity measure is described as you can see here. So it's the product of the intensity parameter, the, the probability mass function, which, uh, which gives the length, and this factor here, which is just, which just says that the paths that we are considering are simple symmetric random walks on ZD, which are run up to the, up to L minus one steps. This L, this uh, not calligraphic L, will mean for me at least the length of the paths we consider, so the length of the worms. And I always, I also will use the calligraphic L, which will be a random variable with the probability mass function. So if we have this definition in hand, we can also define the, the random set, the random set, which is the trace of the, of this random length worms model, which is simply just trace 
of this fluorescent point process. So we are considering the, the main result focusing, uh, focuses, uh, uh, focusing on this random uh, set. And this main result is stated again here, just to emphasize that what we are looking for, what we are want to do. So again, we are given this, uh, this probability mass function, this uh, kind of ugly probability mass function, and we want to prove that, uh, that whatever we chose the intensity parameter, this random, uh, random length worms set, this S V is always super physical, so we all, all, always can find um, an infinite connected, uh, infinite uh, connected cluster build up using the words. And uh, as Balaj mentioned before, so there is this not that strange, but maybe not that uh, easy to digest constraint on the dimension here that we need. To need the dimension to be bigger than five, bigger than or equal to five. Uh, let me give some of uh, some intuition behind that. So, as Balaj mentioned, we to consider sets. To co so we want to. So we cannot use the branching process approximation. So, in a very heuristic level, we want to build up. We want to construct the the this infinite cluster using our bare hands so we somehow want to characterize that if if uh, if we already define the subset of this infinite cluster how can we grow this uh, into a bigger uh, subset and, and also and again a bigger and a bigger one so somehow we want to characterize that uh, the visibility of a subset in that b and this is where the capacity, what, which uh, Bolaj already mentioned, and I think most of you are familiar with this notion, the capacity comes in the picture. So you can define, so we are in the random uh, walks uh, theory, so we can define the entrance time and hitting time of any finite set as usual. And if we are considering the hitting time, we can define this equilibrium measure which is basically just uh, just says that what is the probability that if we are given a finite set k, then starting from as, uh, from a point of this k, we escape to infinity without visiting k again. And if we have this these equilibrium this notion equilibrium measure, then we can define the capacity as the total equilibrium measure of, of K. So here are, I sum over all the points, all the vertices in that D, but as you can see, the equilibrium measure is also um, concent it's concentrated on K. As, so this capacity is concentrated on K. So if you have this definition, uh, you may ask that how this characterizes the visibility of any finite set. And this is done by this last exit decomposition, which is uh, the first sentence in this lemma. Uh, basically, it's a really easy exercise, which, which somehow says that if you are given a finite set K and any vertex, then the probability that we ever visit this K started a random walk at X is this expression, which can be uh, upper and lower bounded using the fact that we are in a dimension at least three, three at, at least or equal to three. So we are in a tran transient, uh, we are in the transient case. So this minimum of the green function and the maximum of the green function uh, can be, it is meaningful. So what is really happening here that this hitting probability can be characterized uh, using the capacity of the uh, given set. By the way, this green function, I hope everyone knows this, but if not, it's like, it just says that what is the X, so the green function at the two vertices X and Y is just the expectation of the times you visit Y when we start the random work at X. 
and you can also prove that in a dimension bigger than or equal to three, the screen function is uh, it is approximately the equals with the, the distance between the two vertices on the power of two minus p. So to be honest, again, so, 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 to be honest, this expression is like not really depends on the green function itself. It's just a capacity and the distance of the two vertices. So, so more or less. And yes, okay, we have this capacity, but you know, we don't really consider just uh, any finite set. We really consider finite sets of uh, build up using uh, random walks with finite range. And this is where the dimension uh, criteria, the dimension being greater than or equal to five comes in the picture because there is a well-known result of Jane and Ore from the 60s, which says that this capacity uh, of the random walk, the range of the random walk satisfies this so-called strong law of large number properties. So if this capacity is comparable to the number of steps random walks, uh, random walk takes, and hence we are in a transient dimension. So five is bigger than three. So this number of steps the random walk takes is comparable to this cardinality. So we can we get that in five in, in uh, dimension five or more, we have that this capacity of a uh, finite range on the world is comparable to its capacity. And this is what we are really want to use in what, in what follows. However, this, this definition of capacity is not that useful uh, in what you want to do. So we really need another characterization. This is the so-called Dirichlet energy characterization of capacity. So you can define, you, if you are given two measures on that, you can define the Dirichlet energy like this um, quadratic form <coughs> with kernel, uh, kernel given by the green function. As you can see, this is a bilinear, bilinear, a bilinear expression. And what is really matters for us is that, that the capacity of any finite set can be characterized using the sub supremum of the uh, algebra algebraic inverse of the energy of any uh, of a probability measure supported, supported by J. So if someone is more familiar with the electrical networks theory, then this theorem more or less is the Thomson principle, but never mind it's not enough. And what we really want to use for, uh, more, so as I mentioned before, the green function can be approximated using only the distance between the given vertices. And this energy is much more easier to, than, uh, to calculate than the probability of escape. So we can, using this characterization the capacity, we can give a lower bound on the capacity, which will be really good for us because we want to do a construction where we want to uh, guarantee that given set we already uh, made up, we already built, is it, it has the so big visibility that we can do another step and grow, an, uh, grow a bigger set and so on. So if we can bound, uh, we can lower bound the capacity of a finite set, then we are good to go. And this lower bound will come from this energy constant, this energy characterization, because to give a lower band on the capacity, we can, we have to, if, because of this characterization, we have to give an upper band of energy. Uh, more, uh, again, this characterization also goes for, for example, prove that, proving that the capacity of the ball of radius air is comparable to air to the power of so if we have this uh, notion of capacity, which describes the visibility of random of a of a, of a set in Z B, we want to what we want to do is 
to build up this infinite cluster in the following way. This is the main intuition behind the proof because we cannot use the branching process approximation. So what's happening here, I, so if it should be a definition of coarse graining, but the coarse graining is not that important if we are just considering the intuition, but I will talk about it. So at the left most, most picture, we have, we have ZD divided into disjoint subsets. And all, uh, this, uh, these are the verbs for us. So the subsets are boxes of side lengths R. And depending on this R, we can divide our verbs into two categories. There will be the short verbs whose lengths are less than or equal to the square of R. And uh, there will be long verbs whose lengths are bigger than that's the square of R. And what we can do, this is the main intuition, the main notion what we are what we want what we are want to do is that we take the, the first box to be, for example, to be because the translation invariance it doesn't really matter which box we took first, but let me took the box of the origin. Somehow we define using the verbs inside, the or the segment of verbs inside the box, we define a seed. Uh, and then this seed will be the base of the infinite connected cluster. And we want to using these boxes, we want to use these boxes to grow, grow a larger uh, cluster and a larger one, defining other seeds in other boxes and connecting them to the already existent cluster. So this is what I did here, as you can see. So at the beginning, there is a seed. Hopefully, we can we can manage to uh, define and we can manage to build up a seed in the box of the origin. And then we look around the neighbors of the so yes, to make to be a bit more precise, uh, let's fix some ordering on the boxes. So in the next steps, in the next step, we look around the the we aiming for the next box, which is neighbor, the box we already uh, observe, and which is the, the next in the in the fixed order. And we are what we are doing is like we want to connect this box to the already uh, defined seed, and then we want to grow some seed on this newly. Uh, newly observed a newly visited box and this is what we do in general so this is the main notion and some of this box will contain so some of this box can be defined can be used to build a seed in it and can be connected to the already existent cluster and some of these are not these two boxes are not that surprisingly called good boxes and bad and what this coarse graining does for us in here is that you can you can just uh, make a bijection between the boxes and the coarse grained lattice. So uh, there's a correspondence between the vertices and the boxes, and you you can just uh, represent the good boxes and the bad boxes in the coarse grained lattice, which will make somehow uh, more easy to, to, do, to do this construction. To be honest, there, so as I mentioned, there is two phase in, in, if when we want to, we want to explore another box, a new box, which is a neighbor of the already explored cluster. The first is that we have to shoot at the, the already explored cluster. This is the target shooting phase. This is, this connects the next newly considered box to the already considered cluster. And then we have to build up a seed in, in there. So to do this uh, target shooting, because I, so, the, so we have to somehow separately consider the seed part and the target shooting part of this uh, cluster building. And, uh, 
as you can see, to do a, a, do this target shooting to to make this target shooting happen happen, what we really need to do we need to bound lower bound the probability that uh, there is a long worm which can be used to reach out for new boxes in the construction. This long worm will, as you can see by the separation between the short worms and long worms, long worms will be used to do this target shooting somehow. So these, these are so long that they can go travel up to more boxes, more than one, and the short worms are not that long, that, so maybe they can be used for building up the seed. And this this will this will happen uh, immediately uh, as I approach the proof. So what I wanted to say here that if we introduce the notation n and the number of long worms emanating from the newly considered box for in the next step, then to have a to have a possibility to grow a new seed connecting to the already uh, explored uh, cluster, we have to guarantee that there is with high probability such a worm which hits the already considered C. And this probability can be guaranteed to be big if we can guarantee that this expectation, the expected number of long worms emanating from this newly considered box is big. And the uh, the heuristic calculation, which can be ma made uh, can be made precise, is the following. So, if we are in the so if cons let us consider these two pictures, we already have the seed here, and we want to go to the right. So, want to uh, consider uh, want to explore this this box. So, what we want to uh, guarantee that inside this box there are, as you know, there are. Um, R to the D many vertices. And since we are in the Poisson point process world, this intensity comes in the picture. So they are uh, V times R to the D times uh, the pro possible length which can uh, connect this newly considered box to the, the seed, the, uh, the previous seed. This will be given by this from this uh, um, product here. So there are many, uh, these are all the many all the many worms that can be used. So no, there are, this is the this is the amount of worms that are long enough to be a candidate to connect this already uh, obtained seed to the new box. However, we also need to, to uh, also need to explore this new. Uh, also, need to guarantee that these worms hit this uh, already uh, explored seed, and this can be done using the the last exit decomposition. So I, we have this many amounts of vertices inside the new box. The the distance between this box and this box is, uh, is approximately r so we can we can use the bound in the green function here and the capacity which describes the visibility of this new uh, of this old old uh, old set is is here so altogether we have that this expectation is approximately this um, uh, can be described using this ex expression and if we can guarantee that this uh, expected uh, expectation is big, then we can also guarantee that this probability of succeeding uh, in the exploring the new vertex, a uh, new box, is uh, is also big. Okay, why is it enough for us? This is a very basic lemma. I since I since no, I I will just uh, put it out here. So if you consider this process, this exploring process, or, and you consider the corresponding constraint lattice, you can prove this lemma, which is a classic result from uh, Grimet and Marston. This is 
this lemma is in that paper about the uh, percolation slabs, which says that if we add, can do, if we can do this uh, um, exploration in such a way that the newly explored boxes, given that what we already explored, the probability that new, this newly explored block, uh, box will contain a seed which contains, which uh, connects to the already explored cluster is high enough, higher than the critical uh, parameter for the site, uh, site percolation ZP, then we can guarantee that this exploration never stops. Okay, this is this G infinite set, the, the explored good sets in this exploration. And using that, this, this exploration never stops. It's easy to prove that the corresponding cluster inside the not contained, so the original, um, original lattice is infinite. Okay, so we can prove, if we can guarantee that this exploration at the steps of this exploration, we have high, uh, high enough probability to succeed, then we can guarantee that there is, uh, uh, there is an infinite, uh, infinite connected cluster in the original uh, lattice and with, uh, with positive probability. And as Balaj mentioned, due to the ergodicity of the random length terms model, this will mean that there is almost surely an infinite connected cluster. So what we want to do is like, we want to define the seeds and we want to use the target shooting to build up this infinite connected cluster. So there will be two, so the main approach is build on two dummy approaches. Let me discuss the first one. The first one, if we, uh, define the seeds inside the boxes to be just the long worms, uh, just the long worm, the segment of the long worm inside the box, which segment is comparable to the length of R, R square. So it, what's happening here, I draw a picture, hopefully it's uh, understandable. So for the first seed, there is some uh, large, uh, so uh, there is one, some long worm with the uh, length around R squared. And the, for the next step, we just consider the worm, we consider this box and uh, we hope for a long worm, which hits this, the previous seed, this, that long worm inside that box. And such a way that inside this newly considered box, there is a segment of this long worm, which is of length R squared. And we can iterate this thing. And if we are doing this one, we, as, as I mentioned before, the capacity of a worm of length R is comparable to its uh, cardinality, which is comparable, in, uh, comparable to its uh, number of steps. So in this, in this case, the seed will be of approximately uh, of uh, R squared, the capacity of this. So if we just uh, substitute back uh, the, this capacity into the previous calculation here, as you can see this calculation of the expected uh, number of long words hitting the uh, already defined seed, then we can, so, so there is a, there is a specific, uh, there is a specific um, probability mass function here, which for which this calculation is pretty easy. So if you choose the probability mass function, the, the one it, which describes the length of the random words like this, then it is easy to see that its tail, the length of the, uh, the tail of the length is, is approximately this amount. So there are uh, this many, uh, um, this many um, long worms in the next, the newly considered uh, box. And this many of them, those will hit the, the seed which we want to hit. So altogether, this calculation gives that this uh, expected number of these good uh, connecting uh, 
low worms is around this, uh, this, uh, this expression. And however, uh, since we choose V to be positive, epsilon to be positive, we can choose a side lengths are so big that this expectation is big, big enough to uh, guarantee that this probability of uh, being existing such of uh, such a connecting long term is at least one over two. In this case, one over two will be enough because, as you can uh, remember, for a per side percolation. In ZD for D big being bigger and uh, bigger or equal than three, the critical probability is strictly smaller than one half. So we can simply just use this lemma this lemma of Grimet Larson if we guarantee that these probabilities are at least one half, which is can, which can be guaranteed in this way. Then we by this Grimet and Larson lemma we have that there is an equally correct component the positive probability hence all the shares. This was a very dummy approach because we really didn't use the short term inside and there are many short terms. Okay, I see that the short terms may be not that long to comparable comparable to the length of this C. This C um, the planks are squared. However, there are many of them. So maybe we can use those. And yes, this is the fact. This is a next approach, a better one. So what we do, it's called the fattening. Uh, let me explain. So we have an already defined seed. And in the next step, we want to explore this box under it. Uh, we have a, a long worm, which hits the seed and has a segment or a slice inside the newly considering uh, considered box with lengths uh, comparable to r squared then if we have this then this slice of this newly considered uh, this slice of this long connecting uh, uh, trajectory or worm can be fattened fat using the small trajectories inside this newly considered box which hit this segment of this, uh, this uh, random wall. In this way, we can, as you can imagine, we can just improve this capacity. So if you just consider this, this segment of uh, this um, long trajectory, then we have capacity comparable to L squared. If, but if we add up these short worms that hit, hit these, trajectory, then we, uh, then we can improve on the capacities, we can grow the capacity. And this is what is really happening here. So uh, what is easy to see, this is what uh, Balazs already mentioned, that if we are considering one vertex, let it be the origin, then the expected number of worms with the fixed length L uh, that hit this origin is comparable to this amount. So the intensity parameter, the probability that the uh, length of the worm is R, L, and the length of uh, the worm itself, so L. And thus, we have that the expect, ex, ex, expected total length of uh, short worm that hit the origin is comparable to the intensity parameter times this truncated second moment of the There are. Some... Oh, okay. Yeah, for a second I thought I froze, like my screen froze. No, no, I, yeah. Yeah, I was about to ask in chat. Yeah. Because yeah. Was... No signal here in Hungary either. Or I think we lost Chani. Using, uh, using the map, if we uh, define the seed in this. Whoops. Hi, Shani. Are you there? 
Yes, I'm there. I'm okay, share your screen. Okay, something went wrong. And by the way, you have uh, uh, 15 mi minutes left, actually a bit less. Yes, yes, I know, I know. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm here, sorry. I hope that it won't happen, but it happened. Okay, so if you do this, we again, we can do the same calculation as before. So this so, uh, of, standard, we, we followed you uh, up to the, uh, you know, using the similar reasoning or so, I think maybe just that first display. After that, we didn't hear you. Uh, which one, this one? No, next slide. Next slide. We heard the first observation, maybe just after that it stopped. Okay, so again, this, uh, we, so you can prove that the expected total length of short term that fits the origin is comparable with this truncated second moment. And this is the size biasing, what, what I talked about earlier. And what you can, what you really can do is that using this information and the method we use for the general theorem is that you can prove that this capacity then, if we define the seed as this fastened set, is uh, it's high probability comparable to this amount. So the capacity of the long short, which, with, which we will fatten, and the additional, uh, additional uh, long, uh, additional short terms that we, which we use to fatten with. If we accept this result, then we can do again the same calculation as before. The expected number of uh, uh, newcomers. So in the new newly considered box, the expected number of uh, long worms that hit, uh, hit a seed that we already defined, it's comparable to this amount, this intensity on the intensity squared and this logarithm. And hence, so sorry, I didn't mention. So in this case, again, I choose another uh, length distribution, this ML. So in this case, we can prove these this uh, approximation. And uh, again, uh, using that this gamma parameter is, is, is greater than, is strictly greater than one half, we can choose R big enough to guarantee that this probability of N being at least one. So there, the probability that there is at least one such trajectory which, on which we can explore the next box is big. I cannot write here that this, if, uh, that if it's enough that this probability is one half because we also need some constraint on the probability that this capacity is in, indeed this amount, but it can be proved that it's, it's altogether is, is bigger than one half. So we can, again, use the green mass Marston method. Okay, so this is another approach. However, we all already didn't use everything. So it, can be happen that if you are considering this patterning, it can be happen that uh, let me see if I, no. it can be happen that uh, if we are given this slice of the short uh, of the long worm, which uh, connects the uh, the new box to the already visited C, it can be happen that there are many uh, short worms inside this box that which didn't really hit. The, the long worm, but it, they hit a short worm that, that, that hits the long worm. So what we can do to improve this capacity result is to do the so-called sequential patterning, which causes the, this, this snowball effect. So sequentially, we do, what we do is like, we are given this slice of the short, uh, long worm, which connects the new, box to the, the old C. And then sequentially for from length to length, we add up, we take the union of those, <clears throat> those uh, verbs that hit, hit the already defined uh, fattened set. So in the first step, we take all the verbs with length one with, that hit the Given uh, long term, given slice of the long term, and the second step, we take all the short terms in the, inside this box 
which uh, hit all the already uh, defined set, this S, S1. So not just a long, uh, strong verb, long verb, but also the short verbs hitting this uh, long verb. And so oh, we can iterate this uh, process and hope, for, hope, that, uh, hope that this really improves on the capacity. And it will, I will eventually. So again, there is a size biasing going on in the background. And you can prove that with uh, high enough probability that uh, you, as you, so you define this as else as, in, as they were in the picture. So if you want to define, if you go from SL minus one to SL, its capacity is comparable to the capacity of SL times this uh, size bias uh, term. And altogether, since we are doing this sequentially, this gives that with high probability, this capacity is uh, approximately is is the uh, is the capacity of the long worm, the slice of the long worm we consider, and uh, this x, x um, <clears throat> this exponential term, which which again there is in, in the exponential term there is this uh, truncated second moment of the of the length length distribution. If you do this and consider the probability measure, what, you, what we are uh, want to consider. So this probability measure here, it's more or less the probability measure, the probability mass function that we defined in the, in the main theorem. So for this, we have that this truncated uh, second moment of the length is approximately is, is, uh, is of order of this amount. The, the also for this probability mass function, the function of the length is approximately this amount. So again, we can bound, we can uh, we can compare this expected number of uh, such worms that hit the already visited C from the new box. Again, we can do the same calculation here, and given give, given these. Uh, approximations, we get that there is a lower bound on this expectation, which can be made big, choosing big, big R again. And hence, we can, again, uh, guarantee that this uh, probability that we will hit in the next, in the new, from the new box, we will hit a, a, an old seed. We can guarantee that this probability is big enough. Hence, uh, since I don't have that much time, don't worry, I don't want to, to talk about all the 28 uh, pages I wrote. So there are many appendices if, I, if there are questions about technical things. But uh, what I really want to do, what I wanted to say uh, is that, first of all, let me convince you that having this sequential patterning and this target shifting and the renormalization which uh, this renormalization scheme, which was described by the Zimmer Markstrand lemma, what we really need to do to make this intuition into a precise definition, uh, into a precise method. Uh, first of all, this needs some more consideration. So, uh, for example, let me uh, add that uh, that okay, we divided up the, the space into boxes. But however, we are considering, and this is why I gave the alternative definition of the land, random length worm scanner. So we are considering the Poisson point process on this abstract space of space of worms. We also want to, uh, given this uh, division of the space, we want to give a corresponding division of the space of worms so we want to define so-called so packages of worms inside these boxes. And uh, there is a policy that if we are considering a new box, we ever consider the new box, we look at all the worms uh, corresponding to that box, then we never go back again 
to them. So if that box was turned out to be bad, we don't use that box again. If that box turned out to be good, then again, we don't use that box again. We, we really don't need to use this box, that box. The reason behind this uh, restriction is that, uh, that it's really hard. So once you open up a box, a new box, and you use some of the worms inside, it's really hard then to give a lower bound uh, on these amounts I specified, specified here. So it's really hard to consider that what remains and how to separate them and so on. Another thing which is important that um, we are in the case of super, so we want to prove a supercritical uh, percolation. So we, the, the, we, so the proving that the expected capacity of the seeds are big, it, it, it won't be, uh, it won't be enough. So we really need to prove some sort of concentration. We really need to prove that the capacity of a given uh, set is uh, uh, big with high enough probability. This is what I did uh, here and earlier. So again, I, I want to state the general result for which I also need to mention that here in the snowball effect, uh, I used lengths one by one. But if we are on the if we are in the case when the length distribution has uh, infinite second moment, just like in this case, in this definition of L, then we can do do the same snowball effect if we not just not considering one by one the length, but we are dividing up uh, the length into intervals and at, at, a, at the time, at the sequence in the patterning, we use more, more multiple lengths to pattern the already, the already patterned set. Okay, so to be uh, to uh, obtain this result. This, so this means that we don't, uh, okay, okay. so it's, it seems like that we are stepping back to, towards to the, that, that patterning phase when we, the, when we define the seed by patterning the long, the slice of the long uh, worm inside the new box with all of the trajectories at the same time, but it's not the case. But, and however, uh, also this separation of the uh, lengths into intervals will help us to do the, uh, help us to prove concentration results. So what we are want to do, I know I, I'm out of time, let me, let, me, let, me, let me give me two more minutes. So this, um, in this construction, we really need to uh, define the, sequence of scales and between these uh, elements of the sequence there will be le uh, lengths which will be used for pattern pattern the set when we are defining the scene. So the main definition what, what was omitted from the first half of the paper because it uh, looks very frightening and it is is this one. Uh, let me convince you that it's not that frightening and in the finish of that. So there are parameters which can be fixed uh, and we can define for those parameters a good sequence of scales. Again, the scales, this sequence uh, will define to be the end, the start and the end point of the intervals length intervals from which uh, intervals we use the lengths to pattern in a step of the sequential pattern. It's such that these things are satisfied. What are these things? The first uh, property, the first property is saying that we can start or factor, we can start or, or not the, pattern, the construction. So we have such a side length in the spatial, uh, in the spatial division of that that inside there exists with high probability a long verb. This next two uh, uh, property says 
basically that this the amount of uh, short worms when we do do this sequ sequential fastening using not uh, one this length one by one but uh, multiple uh, multiple lengths at the same time this uh, truncated second moment is is positive uh, it's 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 be, it's about a certain uh, about a certain level. And also this fattening star, this means that we can uh, fatten this. So we fatten the, uh, we fatten the long, uh, the slice of the long trajectory, the long worm inside the box of size Rn. So this fattening star says that we cannot fatten the, the long trajectory, the slice of the long trajectory more than, than then more more than we have inside the the box itself. Again, and uh, the target shooting parameters is basically if you are if you are reordering this one, it's basically the the calculation on the num on the expected number of uh, long trajectories hitting the already uh, defined C from the new box. And what you can see here is that if we are given uh, such a um, such a length mass probability mass function, which for which the second moment is infinite, then you can guarantee the fattening this second property in such a way that there is this uh, increasing sequence of uh, good scales, which for which all the all the terms are finite. However, the, the, the target shooting uh, condition is not, not satisfied for all of these, uh, all of these distributions. Okay, so if we are having, uh, if, we are, if we have this definition, we can state the general result, the general theorem from which the, not that general, but if prior state priori stated uh, main theorem follows is that that if we are uh, in the in the situation that we can we that we have a good sequence of scales then we can do the sequential fattening and target shooting in such a such a way that the exploration never uh, never stops so it's eternal and hence this uh, random worm the set of um, the, the the cluster of the origin will be infinite, hence the set of terms will follow. Okay, I don't want to talk that much because I don't want to do this. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask them. Thanks, Sander. Uh, any questions for Sander? Uh, I have one uh, sort of very general question. Okay. Is about what you call as dynamic uh, renormalization. Maybe it's that yeah. something I don't understand this very well. What is the dynamic part of it and what would be if it was somewhat static? I mean, uh, yes, um, it's, it's a really nice question. It's a good question. So, dynamic means here that um, as you can see, we are uh, just look at this uh, figure. So we are in this coarse grained lattice. We define, according to some rules, we define uh, the vertices of this coarse grained lattice, uh, good and bad. And we are in a dynamic renormalization scheme when this definition of being a, a vertex good or bad, it depends on what we explored before. Okay, so not, so when you explore this, any lattice, so it don't have to be uh, core chain, but in this case, it's core chain. But if you ex uh, explore a lattice, and uh, it, it's obvious that you you have, so you want to build a connected set. So it's obvious you have to know that where you are, what will be the next uh, next uh, vertex that you will uh, observe, you, know, you will examine that if it's good or bad. But in the dynamic, uh, uh, in the dynamic, uh, this 
for us, this will, there will be another twist in this story because it's not only the, the previously examined vertices, not only say, say that which will be the next uh, vertex that we will look into, but there, the information gathered by those already uh, examined vertices will also give information that if that new vertex is good or bad. And this is a dynamic. And in a static, uh, we call this phenomenon static when this, when this is not the case. So yes, the exploration gives you that which vertex you have to examine. But the, other than that, there is no dependency in that which what if, if this newly examined vertex is good or bad. This is more or less the difference between static and dynamic. I don't know if you understand that. No, 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 that was, that was very helpful. Thanks, thanks a lot. Any other questions?